everybody. Um, this is KW Ruby for February. Um, as we've discovered by consulting the various one of calendars, apparently this is the most popular day for meetups <laughs> because everybody's had everything. So I appreciate that you've come to close this one. Um, so uh, Mary is going to give us a presentation on showing off her work of using Azure Machine Learning and uh, Blob Storage in Ruby. Um, she's the, as some of you may know, she's the data scientist at uh, Funnel Cake. Uh, Funnel Cake does sales and marketing analytics. And I think there's at least some right, two people in the room. Yeah. Funnel Cake. Uh, they are always hiring, so if you're looking for work, Oh, I see business <laughs> cards, so. uh, Let's see, we're gonna, I'll follow up with links in the discussion and probably send them out for Twitter. Um, Mary's gonna follow up with, she's gonna be doing some blog posts uh, related to the post. If you're interested in the Azure stuff, Lori is gonna be, Lori, sorry, am I getting your name right? Yes. Lori, uh, her group, uh, her .NET group is running an Azure uh, workshop. Dev test, but no, it's a dev test session. Um, so Sharon Bennett will be uh, just speaking on setting up dev test labs in Azure. So, so if, if Mary sells you on, <laughs> so if Mary sells you on Azure and you can't get enough Azure at the end of tonight, it's more Azure tonight. Yeah. <laughs> but um, that one is completely filled up, maybe or. Oh. No, no, not yet. Oh, got okay. it. And at the wow. central, at the central Kitchener park. Library. Yeah, the one oh. that's been. Okay. Wow. All right. Uh, let's see. So for the rest of KWRI, we are approximately booked out until June. Um, Kareem is going to be presenting on the Trailblazer gem uh, next month. That's a gem for adding extra structure to Rails applications. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. We've had a few previous ones on hexagonal Rails kind of stuff. Um, I think Trailblazer is another example of uh, sort of a more concrete example of how to structure Rails after you've gone past all the out-of-the-box stuff. Uh, in, what, what month am I getting to? April. Yeah. April, uh, Josh Teeter is going to be giving us a presentation on using Rust with Ruby. So um, the same way that you would have used a C extension for a Ruby module to make things faster, um, you can use a Rust extension uh, and get some of the benefits of memory management and the various benefits of Rust. Um, so he's going to cover that. He's done a gem that does string interpolation. So interpolation? No, that's not the right terminology. Changing camel case things to uppercase things and playing around with how your strings are formed. So he makes it fast. Uh, in where am I? Where did May? I get to? I got to May. May and June. Uh, Vidyard has volunteered to host us for the first time. So we're. We're, I'm excited that we're getting some new uh, new company faces. Um, okay, uh, we'll, we'll probably do a Ruby contribution workshop in May, so we'll get together and work on some open source projects. Uh, and then June, we're still figuring out what the presentation is. Maybe something from someone at Vineyard, but maybe something else. So we shall see. Everything shall be posted on the website. Uh, and Mary mentioned that she was looking for feedback. So if you've got uh, at the end of her presentation, if you've got any comments, we can, we'll take a few minutes to uh, do some follow-up. Um, would you like feedback afterwards, if uh, people don't feel comfortable? Yeah, that's fine. Cool. Uh, so, afterwards, uh, we'll get links and everything posted out to follow up. George is videotaping, so we'll have a videotape that we'll also, or a video that we'll also do a link to. Yeah. And I think that's it. Anybody have any news, that, anything that they want to announce? Anybody desperate with a presentation topic that they want to give? <laughs> All right, excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Thank you for the wonderful introduction. And so my topic today is Ruby on Azure. And as you only know, like, cloud applications are getting really important. And I put up like a quote here that like 35% of new applications will be cloud enabled in 2017. And therefore it's also important like to know how Ruby actually will be used in the cloud. And also data-driven 
companies are also currently growing. So therefore, we are going to make a sm small story today about Dana, the data scientist, and Frank, the full stack developer, who will be building their unicorn in the cloud with some data science. And so we have the data scientist Dana and the full stack developer Frank. It's pulled off of my first, first computer book from like 30 years ago, so pretty old, <laughs> but still nice to have them. And so the data scientist loves mathematics, she loves programming in R and Python. She has some background in SQL and non-SQL databases. And she also will watch the cloud costs of the solutions and will be maintaining the data lake, so where they will be dumping all their data. Then we have the full stack developer, Frank. He loves programming a lot. He, can, he has some background in mathematics, but it's not his most favorite thing. He loves Ruby and Java as programming languages. And he wants to focus on the DevOps, and he also mainly loves working with Linux. And the idea that they have and built for this. that they're going to build is like, <laughs> they go from a lot of novels, they're going to extract some data science related graphs and the ideas that you need to try to guess which novel is actually being shown here. So, anyone an idea for this one? <laughs> Otherwise, there's... Pregnant? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yes! <Hey. laughs> you can jelly me. Yeah. <laughs> Fun thing, right? So that's their idea, like automatically building like these things. So what are they thinking about from the decisions now? So they say, okay, we're going to be like a SaaS company and we want to host our solution in the cloud. We're going to use virtual machines. Uh, data, Dana wants to use data science software, but Frank is really keen on using Ruby. And the important thing is like the data science solutions needs to be connected to the Ruby solution, and therefore they will need to figure out how they will be able to work with the web services. With, with web services, but for the rest, they have some front end software to nicely show their HTML. They need to get their novels up in the cloud, so they need cloud storage. They also need to have the web service going and need to figure out their DNS and IPs set up. And finally, they also want to make sure that their cloud costs are not getting too high. So where will Ruby all be going on? So we will have virtual machines. They need to make sure like, that they nicely can install Ruby there, have data science, there is no Ruby involved, so that may Dana will be happy. Next, the backend software, which will be nicely Ruby layer, so Frank will be happy, and then there's the connection between the data science and the backend side. The front-end software, later on, they will be moving on to Ruby on Rails, but currently they will be leaving that out. For cloud storage, they will be looking at blob storage. I will also explain that one later on. The web server will be Apache 2. And then they still need to figure out the DNS and the IP set, the IP setup and the cloud cost. So the architecture will look like this. So we have first over here they will store all the different books. Next they will extract all the data in a more workable format for which is called the ETL process, and then they will store everything and block storage. Next, there is the setup that has been made, or the experiment that has been made in Azure Machine Learning Studio that is figuring out all the nice, uh, making the word clouds, making all the different histograms. And these ones are pulled together in this layer and it are configured to a nice HTML page, page which finally is shown in Apache. So 
what are the big parts I currently will be focusing on in this talk. So first, the virtual machine, because this is the important thing when we're working in the cloud. You need to have a place to work in the cloud, so you need to know how you need to set it up. Next, the blob storage, so your hard drive in the cloud. How will you be able actually put everything there? Next, Dana built the web service, so the, how will we actually be able to execute the web, web service? And finally, we will discuss the cost a bit. So first goal is setting up the virtual machine, so we will be able to work on the Ruby layers in different parts, and at the same time, I also will use that virtual machine to host the web service. So some important parts with setting up the VM in Azure, you need to get your public IP set up, you need to set up your network security, and you need to install Ruby and Apache too. So the nice thing with Azure is, so how many guys of you are used with working with Linux and Ruby? So, and then you also know like when you normally SSH into a box, you have two options. You have the option whether you are using your public key to get a connection, or you have the option to just always type in your password. So for Ruby, for Azure, you also have to both possibilities. You can set up your key, or you can actually use a password. So here, just putting some small reminders how to quickly set up your key again. So if you're not forgot it about it, so you just can use Putty Key Generator, and you will be able to generate your key, save your key, and later on use that to access the portal, and we also will need the Azure portal. So what you actually see here is like a screenshot of the Azure portal, and as you see, you can, in a really easy way, make a virtual machine. So over here, give the name of your virtual machine, give your user with the name where you will be logging in. So here you have the two options, either you log in with a public key, your password and the nice thing is also that you work with the resource group you actually can say like this will all for example be Ruby meetup related so that you nicely can organize everything together second option what you need to have is like choosing like the virtual machine that you want to work with have different kind of options is also giving the estimated cost. And next, because we're going to use this VM also as a web server, you need to choose like your public IP. And then we can choose between a dynamic and a static one. And final thing which is also important is configuring your network roles that you actually will be able to allow HTTP requests to your virtual machine. And then nicely, because we have also set up this public IP address here, you will be able to actually connect to your virtual machine in the cloud. And over here you can set your public IP. Next part for installing Ruby and Apache. The sudo app get install is not the best strategy because you get an older version. So therefore instead you can use rbenf and next I use this for setting up Ruby 2.4.0 and finally you will need actually Azure and HTTP party for being able to perform the rest of the talks of, of the talk and then also need to install Apache 2. Okay, and this gives gets us going with the virtual machine in the cloud. And now we can do the real work. It's just was also mentioning this here now because the, the main not issues, the main task that you always have in the cloud is first getting your machine there before you just can start to run. So okay. 
So this brings us now into the blob storage. So we need to be able to put our stuff in the cloud. And this will enable us to put the books in the cloud, perform like the blob storage for web service processing, and also just store our results back from Azure. Okay. So what is blob storage? Blob storage, you can when you see that as a big hard drive in the cloud, and you can store there anything what you want. You can store there text stuff, you can store there binary stuff, you can access it through HTTP or HTTPS, and some usage for it is you can store images there, you can log, store logs there, you can store video and audio. And also some concepts here, so you have the account that you're working on, you can see this as your user account, for example, on Windows. Next you have the container, which you can see actually as your directories, and next you have the blobs itself, which are actually the files. Okay. So this is lots, lots of stuff before I get to real Ruby stuff. So. <laughs> but, okay. So next you have how can you actually try playing with blob storage? Has anyone played with? Cloud accounts in the past, or like uh, uh, AWS stuff. Okay. So indeed, similarly, if you want to work with Azure, you can also try like the free month trial for two hundred dollars. I can sign up with it, and then you can also play around with some of the stuff here. So, and so if you want to play with Blob Storage, so you sign up for your Azure trial account. You create a blob storage account in this way. Again, you go to the portal, you have add, and then you will find the storage account. <coughs> Some <coughs> options that you can choose here is you can give a name for the storage account, you can again select the resource manager and put on some extra options. Next, you will need to be able to access your storage account, and this will actually be by some extra keys over here. So how will we actually be able now to access the blob storage? Therefore, you first need to install the Azure Jam. And over here, you see we had the leg of books, which is my Azure account name. Next, you have the access keys, which will provide you access. And over here, you have the CSV books, which actually will be the container where everything is available. So how will you be able to access this? Like I said, you need the Azure gem, and you build up your connection string. Connection string will, will consist of your account name together with the access key, and in this way you actually will be able to set up different values and you get access to your Azure Book Service. And it is a little up a bit higher. So now, how can you get? your listings actually of Azure and your blob service, you see over here the whole list. Oops. How do you get the listing of this? Then you actually have Azure blob service object that we generated before and just actually ask for this blobs and you get the storage from the storage container name and you nicely get a listing of all the different files. This one is just putting up this listing, but you can also see that you easily just can, for example, access the file numbers. So actually pretty easy to do. And you don't only want to get a listing of it, you also just want easy to download actually your blog storage. And in a similar way, you just can 
look over all the different objects and what you see is you get the blob storage container name and the file name and this will actually allow you to download your files on blob storage and then you get them on your Azure VM. So in this way you can actually still move your stuff your, your files in the cloud, which indeed sounds a bit weird. So you can put it locally, but you can also just move it around in the cloud to different VMs. Thing what you also need to take in mind there is like if you're moving it around at different places, also make sure to delete it at the one place that you don't have like a bunch of copies because otherwise it might get pretty gusty. Okay. So we have now built up the next all the different parts of the architecture and now we're getting to this piece. So we have the Azure Machine Learning solution which will allow us actually to, which is making all the different nice graphs, how will we actually be able to automatically extract these ones. So Azure Machine Learning Studio is actually also the thing I love the most about Azure. The reason behind it is actually that you can see you can combine different parts of different languages there. So you can use R, you can use Python, you can easily connect, actually get things from SQL Server, you can use stuff from Blob Storage, so you can put everything there, you can make your graphs and then you convert it to a web service and then you nicely just download everything and connect it together. So in that way, people who, when you're doing data work, you can easily work here. And then next, you can convert it to a web service and then you actually easily, so yeah, the other people, the programmers just, just use it, get the data, what they need, they can get the images, what they need, and they can move on. And everybody can use the technologies they love, so. And what you see here, so the way I built this, so I can later on also make, give a small demo from the, from the website itself, but like what you see here, you have a book over here that is staked in block storage, and I connect like one, like one column from it, and next I'm executing different R scripts. Some of them are making the work clouds, other than oh, other ones are actually making like the the histograms and just quick if you actually would see here you're clicking on this one here and this is actually giving like this work cloud over here so data scientist is doing his or his or her work doing some analysis getting some pictures eventually she's really getting happy with the results and then she's actually saying okay i want to expose this as a web service so therefore she's just putting in these blue boxes there and there she's just saying okay i want you to get this result if the other result just might be a number or a, a data column then she's just putting here a connection for the web service output and then you just easily can get connected with that result. Well, like you see, in such blocks, you're putting your R code. You see here, like, you're putting up a word cloud, but you nicely see. And then, ID is like, she's generating all these different pictures, which next are being put in the HTML file. This is again like the nice. And over here you also see like the input and that one you can just put like any blobs, blob storage file which you can pull through further on. Okay. So the result has been converted to a web service and now you actually will need to put in the inputs and the outputs. So what you see here the input one will be the file 
actually with the with the, uh, the parts of the box and over here you have actually the output and you see you're connecting each time here your connection strings you're providing the account keys like we had before and the different locations so you see here word cloud selected my containers so they are all belonging to the different blue boxes that we had over here so you see all the different blue boxes below, ditch these ones, or all each time, two lines here, where you're defining them and where you're actually getting back those results from the cloud. Mm -hmm. Is it okay for everyone or? I'm a little bit confused. Okay, yeah. So this is the payload from one of the services? This is, yeah, so indeed this one. So you have this experience, <coughs> otherwise, one second. So, so each of those services has its own endpoint that the yeah. Rails app or the Ruby app can connect to, right? Yeah. One okay. second. Yeah. Here, so this is the big part. So, what you have here, this is the environment where you're working on, and over here. Maybe the other internet faster for you? The guest Wi Fi or? Guest will be worse than antenna. Okay. Okay, go. Oh, and I'm on the wrong one. That's it. So when you're actually working as a data scientist with Azure ML, you have here the different experiments. So I worked on this one and the whole book that I'm loading in. And, um, and the box at the top is just the raw... This is right, the raw data, data. yes. Yeah. Okay. So the raw data over here, if you <coughs> see. Okay. It's like actually some safe data, data sets, so you can actually just upload them from the cloud and to the cloud, and then you just have your data sets here. Mm -hmm. So if you would want like... just add in like here a new data set, select something from locally and it just easily goes there. Mm -hmm. okay. Benefit in this way is like when you're actually working like 
on setting up a data solution, you only want to worry about nicely putting in all your images and everything. You actually don't want to care about like how do I get my stuff. Mm -hmm. So next, you're combining everything. So doing some stuff here and first one. So I was saying, okay, I want to see a word cloud. So I wanted to build like the word cloud to the left over there. I know like in R there's some cool stuff available about how I actually can build a word cloud. So what I do then is I say, okay, I like R for this. I put in R code for that. Only thing I need to worry about is how do I get my data in? And then you just see, because you have here two different blocks, two different dots. So this is data set one, this is data set two. And this one is if you want to add in like an extra or library or something, you just put that one in there. And if, if you don't, are not happy with all the stuff that Azure already has, you just put it in there. And then you just put in all the different things. You have your work cloud over here. And if I let's say visualize, you see nicely there your data set appearing. And also what's important to notice here is like you have the graphics title here. This is the one that we later on will be retrieving back from what is saved in the data set so that you will be looking for graphics and then you just pick out your graphic there. Okay. And similarly, also you see here is, this one is set as word cloud all. And that word cloud all will be like what you see in the payload. That one will be defined as word cloud all. Similarly, frequency all, this is like, Here you have a histogram, what I'm putting in here. Similarly, I want to extract this histogram from the graphics. And also, if you just want to use other stuff from Azure and you can, you can also just use those ones in there. But like, I mainly prefer using it in this way because I like the R code, what I have, and then I just Extract it from there. So, and there is no way kind of to to, to kind of add all those services into one service. So it's kind of easier for the app to communicate with one service to retrieve all those yeah. charts. Yeah, indeed, this will be as one service. So it's one service with like five endpoints. Oh, so indeed, that's the thing. Like that makes sense. So like you see, I'm building up like all these different graphs here. I say like, here are all the graphs. Mm -hmm. They are defined in these different ways. And you have one web service who's generating them all. Okay. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, and was that what you were at the yeah, you were showing to start with? That was the links to each of these endpoints. Yeah, uh, okay. yeah. Maybe went a bit too fast over this, so sorry about that. So and then you also see like, then I, you're finally happy with it. So you have the endpoints. So each one of them, I give a nice name, word cloud selected, yeah. frequency selected, k-mean and everything. And over on top, you actually get the endpoint. Then you say deploy as a web service. You have the web service that is being generated and see here all your deployed web services and you have here your key which maybe you can cut out later on George <laughs> <laughs> and it, you can just do a response that you would just give like one sentence like this case we have a batch execution because we're giving a whole book and then you have code that's being generated here and this is like the request payload where you nicely see now 
the, the, the here's your input part and these are work clouds all we can see all work clouds selected there are all the outputs that you're getting which are being stored in the cloud with all the different block services so this is the, the payload for the services for the services not, okay yeah and so then you can choose like you can play around if you want to have like your output in a different container than your input you can actually put like different directories here because each time you see like you have my container here so you can play around with all of them so that you actually can arrange everything and this is like all the different parts that you're actually adding in and good thing is also if you would see the example code here is not it's only C sharp Python and R so actually I have the Ruby example <laughs> for it. <laughs> so and this brings us actually back here. So those scripts they are different, yeah? Yeah, they are because I'm a puzzled a little bit because the label says, you know, execute, execute, execute. So uh, the scripts are not labeled. So you can do something else if you bring back the, the diagram. Besides executing, you can do something else with the scripts. So you mean for this one? So you mean no, no. When when you show the the diagram with the flow. Yeah. So you can also use parts of code of Azure. So you know what I mean? You have execute, execute, yeah. execute, but the scripts are different, yeah? Yeah, that's So I was different. wondering why you didn't label them with... Okay, that is like, you can put in here like a small label. The execute R script is more the part like how they're labeling them in Azure ML. So you can put in here some extra thing or are you say building word cloud? My question, can you do something else besides execute? You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, I see the label there, execute R. Yeah, so you can do also other things also with R that you're building, or you can extract things. Oh, okay. Or you can, for example, transform data, or you can do some statistics with other ones. So this is build other models. So you have a lot of possibilities here, like right? statistical functions. You can put like anything you want in there. So. This brings us. So these are, for example, statistical functions are yeah. are uh, Azure uh, machine learning yeah. uh, APIs that yeah. you can. Uh, yeah, for, oh, okay. Or you can also do like SVM learning, uh, machine training, or something in there. So you can a lot of stuff is just available there. And if it, it's not available in Azure, you can use it from Python or from R. So. So if you select that, it will generate like boilerplate with that functionality yeah. okay 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 so got these parts so and like you see here you have the first part which is your input the other parts which are then next all the different blue blocks boxes below and now we can actually be going back to Ruby and here we have your first need to define a payload and which combines like of inputs and outputs and we're first going to build up like a three-dimensional hash which we next are going to be converting to a JSON file so from the inputs we have our connection string together with the relative location so storage container name and similar way for my outputs I prefer to add in timestamps in this way they are automatically all different and otherwise you're always overwriting the same ones and here you see the different tags that we also put first in Azure Machine Learning Studio and which you next will actually need to define your payload further so over here I have the URL that has been defined for my web service. This is also an API key that has been defined in that one script. In that way, you can actually 
make your headers what you need for the web service and your response, therefore, you need the HTTP party. You will be next, actually, start your job. And from this, you will get back your job ID. You will be looping over the job till it has been done. And next, you can actually download all the different blocks and then you get in your virtual machine all the results back. Now just a little bit small trick. If you see here, you have CSV files. And actually, like I said, I was downloading images. It's like a little bit of trick, actually, because normally you only get CSV files, but you can also connect the second dot, but you can't call them something different as a CSV file because then Azure is complaining, but it still lets you download everything. And then you see over here, actually nicely, the graphics title, and that's actually the one that we're now trying to get. I took JSON, and what will we be doing for that? For example, I played with the frequency all one. Oh, no, I'm playing here with all the different ones. So I have already downloaded all the different files. Next, I just need to get Rid out of a little bit initial text was just saying JSON output. You don't need that, so we just drop this. And next, we are parsing through till we have graphics, and then we nicely save these images as PNG files, and we put them in the HTML file. Okay. So finally, we'll still need to have some extra bookkeeping for our Apache 2 server. We need to make sure that we copy our HTML file over towards var www.html. We put the PMG file, the style file, and make sure that all our files have the correct owner so that Apache can see it. And then we can go to this IP address, but they also map it to the title game, the data constructors.com. So and then indeed we saw it nicely. Yeah, we have seen it before, I can show it later on. But the important thing what we still need to know finally is what is now actually the cost of this solution. And nice thing about Azure, if you are like on a trial subscription or on a paid subscription, <laughs> not for our subscription, we always need to wait till the end of the month what <laughs> the cost will be. But they are giving like a nice breakdown over the different costs. So I worked like two days on preparing for this meetup. So you see the big cost is actually your virtual machine. And next was an IP address that I allocated earlier, but couldn't get it turned off. So that therefore this one is gaining, uh, getting some memory. And then you have disk space, which is also important to take into account. And then you actually also see a nice breakdown. You have virtual machine, indeed, which is custom one dot forty two. But you have also like the storage, which is uh, part of your virtual machine, which also actually takes some takes up some money. And together with the IP that we are actually selecting for it. But you see, like the just storing like some stuff in blob storage alone is a good cost, but you also just need to make sure that you're not like saying, okay, I just put everything in my virtual machine, so it will cost less than I'm putting it in blob storage, but you have also yeah, the drive which belongs to your virtual machine, which also actually takes up a lot. And conclusion is, for today, we have learned how Ruby and Azure can work together, so how you can set up virtual machine, how to use blob storage, how to call a web service generated from Azure ML and which costs you have. And the future work for Dana and Frank, they're thinking about a Slack integration, continuous delivery, and also are going to investigate different data sources. Are there some extra questions? Well, clap them first.
I'm kind of curious about the technology choices, like uh, deploying a Ruby app to uh, 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 Azure. Yeah, therefore we have... Because it looks like uh, you don't really need to deploy it there because it looks like your uh, uh, machine learning stuff can generate its own service, right? Yeah, it's just like... Like, uh, for example, at our company, we use Ruby, so we have like, we also use rate tasks from Ruby, so they're really governing like all the different parts, how data is flowing in. And there we also have like a Ruby on Rails application. And so it's also more, more like, next we're going to see like, how can we actually incorporate data stuff with uh, with Azure Machine Learning Studio, and then the question was like, how can we nicely plug in this part from Machine Learning Studio into Ruby? And, and what what's the backend uh, uh, database for the there is app? Uh, so we use Azure SQL Server, oh, okay. and that's actually just like we have database instances in the cloud. So in this way, so that's the only. The only SQL database available on Azure, right? You can also use MySQL there, right, Robert? Yeah. You can use MySQL there also, and if you want to have like your own thing that you're developing, you can also spin off like a VM hosted there. Okay. But like we use their Azure SQL Server because it's our hosted instances. You just say like I want to have a database, and your database is there, yeah. and like all the backup stuff is managed by by Azure so that you don't need to worry about it. If you want to have your database bigger, you just go to the next instance and you have a bigger database. And I'm not sure, maybe I missed it, like how much does it cost to do the machine learning stuff uh, that hosted on Azure? Like, you have... Because I'm not sure if it was in the, in the breakdown yeah. or did I miss it? Or? It's like, the, what I currently use is like the free version of uh, like... Azure Machine Learning Studio, and then it's like um, you can do like a few thousand or something, like just web service calls for it. Okay. So the cost that you have is actually just putting your files in the cloud. So the block storage cost that you have there that is actually the cost related to calling your Azure Machine Learning Studio. And then next, like for example, we use it for a bit of bigger application, and there our cost is like twenty dollars a month for Azure Machine Learning Studio, wow. which is kind of nice. So. Yeah, that's that's awesome. <laughs> so from that point of view, it's like mostly like just the moving of your files that you're paying for, but like for our application, it's like twenty bucks a month, and also like you have so many hours that you can use it actually, and next day or charging or me, it's like also. A little bit that you pay like for using it as a developer, but it's yeah, it's like when you're playing around with it, it's like really affordable. So yes. because like you see like for the part of Azure Machine Learning Studio here, I only needed to I just use my free account for it. Like for the other part, it's like there I had a voucher. So yeah. so and does this is an example? Does this make or is this a good, I guess, what am I thinking? Does this follow like the same kind of structure you would use for a production system where your, sort of your machine learning yeah. generates your results and then your web servers yeah. don't touch the machine learning part and just kind of serve yeah. the results appropriately? Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, we have currently like the title normalizer that we use like to clean up a lot of titles and like I first and beat nicely built like the whole machine learning part, chat is the next calling all the different parts, he's just feeding data there. He doesn't need to care about machine learning stuff, he gets data back, and that's what we are showing to the clients then. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that, that speaks, I guess, to the cost as well, because it's not, it's not something that's kind of running all the time no. for your web service, it just does its thing. And, and then, then, yeah, the and then yeah, you just spin up an instance, mm -hmm. it's running there and it stops. Yeah. Hmm. And it can also run multiple. I believe it's six or seven batches that you can run simultaneously of big batches and then skewing itself and then when one worker is released, the next one is being pulled in. Yeah. Yeah, I guess if you can decide if, if you've got big enough data or 
Yeah. You need fast enough results yeah. to pour in as much money as you'd like to make it as fast as you want. Yeah, that's true. But the web service is hosted in Azure, yeah? Yeah. So uh, you you pay uh, for each access to the service, or uh, it has to be up all the time because you don't know when someone accesses it. It's it's for the access that you pay. So it's just it's more I think more in the ID like Lambda function. Like just when you need it, that mm -hmm. it's being called, and otherwise it's just not eating resources. So. Can you use like a compression to minimize resource usage? Yeah, CSV file. Yeah, probably, yeah, that's true. You just need, need to just decompress it at some place, but indeed, definitely different places that you can look to save extra money. <laughs> what do you mean by data, different data sources for the future work? I was a little bit of a joke, like now it were just novels, but they can also just use songs or they can use like, music, no sorry, movies or something, just use text from there and just saying like, what are they seeing now? I mean from the transcripts, yeah? Yeah, from the transcript, yes. Can convince Microsoft to load Project Gutenberg into Azure so you can just have it. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I don't think that Project Gutenberg would like that. <laughs> <laughs> they say there, if they see if you would be automatically downloading from their stuff, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that they would block your IP, yeah. so. <laughs> I only downloaded one book, so <laughs> no, four books, but I only used one, so. Hmm. Um, have you worked with any of the other sort of cloud machine learning systems for comparison, or? No, okay. just we at Funnel Cake, we got to do, yeah, we are working with Azure, and so they're friendly to look at that solution. No, 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 I, I completely understand. I, yeah. I work with uh, Amazon in my work, and I was like, I should probably spend some time looking at other systems. So like, I got enough to do yeah. doing this and when it when it works and it does the job. Yeah. yeah, just like initially when we were looking for a cloud provider, we were a little bit comparing the different systems, but uh -huh. it's just like when you choose one, you yeah. just need to see what, what's available <coughs> there. And I also really like it a lot, like certainly like this concept of Azure Machine Learning Studio is nice because mm -hmm. something I also saw like more than 10 years ago, like when I was a researcher with medical imaging there, we had the same concept with all the different blocks connecting them together. So I was happy to see that stuff coming up again here. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and certainly as you said, the idea of being able to sort of have the, the data scientist who doesn't want to know all the details yeah. of the Ruby stuff and the Rubyist who doesn't want to know all the details of the statistical yeah. stuff and being able to give them each a useful interface is really nice. Mm -hmm. What about Slack integration? You mean uh, to, to parse the content of the, the chats yeah. or? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, like, just some jokes. Like It's just like always the next thing what you say to a startup, you want to have this in Slack. <laughs> People are growing <laughs> or clicking through it and then we get more, more clients or more viewers. So. Yeah. Did you, like yeah. <laughs> Did you play with more sophisticated machine learning stuff in uh, uh, machine learning studio? Um, like I played a little bit with the clustering there and I built like a kind of a large rule based system in this one here. But it also just depends a little bit on the time that you have better you can play around with all the stuff. So I also played a little bit with the SVMs, but was not really like working like this. Mm -hmm. But I played in the past in different contexts with machine learning studio. So not machine machine learning, so not the machine learning studio where we needed to do more programming ourselves. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, maybe sort of similar to that question, what, um, are there any things that are in Azure that you haven't played with yet that you're interested in playing with? Um, I am interested in looking more like automation stuff. Mm. But you always need like knowing more what's available, or for example, 
looking more how you easily actually can go on VMs in Azure and so things like that and maybe looking more to load balancing and yes. like we are only currently using like a small size of Azure because yeah. there's lots of things available and each week lots of new things are coming out so it's hard to keep track of everything. How about the servers, serverless hype right now, yeah? So if you look like the Azure Machine Learning Studio is actually part of it, so that you're not really, like also the Azure SQL Server where you just say like, I just want a database, I don't care how it's hosted. There are actually things that are part of it, so which is kind of nice that you don't need to set up everything. Disadvantage is that you don't have control over everything. Serverless means that uh, you access like a, f a function, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, yeah, yeah. You mean like the Lambda function? Yeah. You need this like, but you can see like Azure Machine Learning Studio. Like, if you have your web service, it's like actually part of it because you don't care where it's hosted. You're just mm -hmm. calling it when you need it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sort of a more special. I guess it's a more specialized version of the same thing. It's yeah. Sort of, you call it. It does a thing. And it's, you don't care about the details. Yeah. It's actually also, for mm. example, it's maybe not the nicest thing to say, but sometimes when Azure ML crashes, you actually see in the logs that actually how everything is being spun off. But you actually see that your server is first being generated, it's doing its things and it's going away again. So okay. based on that, you actually see like the process behind it, that everything is coming up. So. Um, and is the, the Azure gem that you were using, uh, yeah. is that the same thing? You, you were mentioning like um, working on using other parts of Azure and like load balancing and spinning, up, spinning machines up and down. Is the Azure gem the same way you do that? Is that the Ruby way to talk to Azure? That's the Ruby way to talk to Azure. Like you have different APIs mm -hmm. to talk to different parts of Azure. And then actually, you can also just to the portal do a lot of things like where you can automate things. And otherwise, one second, I was on my own account, so I want to add a database. This is indeed what just what is allowing you to do all the different stuff and just get your database here. Similar thing like these are all like all the different parts we're playing on with here. Like I said, like the network interface is here that you actually can add in all different parts of security, which are all indeed things that you do through the Azure portal. Later on, if you would want to automate it. And you might be looking into an API, but the benefit is to have like the two options. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's nice to have this to get started. And then, yeah. 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 So when when you decide you want to do it a thousand times, then you can you automate it. Then they have a bunch of scripts again to automate it. So. Nice. so. And how have you found the Azure Gem to work? Um, easy to use? Um, it was easy to use. Yeah. Like you also saw, it's just like you need to download it, and it's like I think. I spent an hour or something like having my scripts up and running when I needed it for work and the only challenging part more was like how to call the web service from Azure ML because the code was not available. Mm -hmm. It was also for me the first time that I was calling a web service from Ruby. So I also first needed to learn how you call a web service from Ruby <laughs> and then I need converting the Python code to the, yeah. to the Ruby code but it's neat if you're Use the working which will be a lot, then it's definitely not like a big deal. So, yeah. Hmm. Um, I've, I've, have you worked with the Azure Gem long enough to see if it keeps up to date with uh, the Azure API itself? This could also be something you just haven't worked with long enough to see that. I just hope that it keeps working, yeah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> just like, but yeah, it's like also not that. It's just like listing files, getting files, and downloading files, so mm, that should yeah, be fine. So hopefully it's straightforward. Yeah. yeah. All right. Does anybody else have any more questions for me? Feedback on the presentation.